Hi there, we are live from Indianapolis, the Central Indiana section of the Audio Engineering Society and IUPUI's Department of Music and Arts Technology Next Sound Series presents the first in a series of roundtable discussions about different career tracks in the audio industry. This evening's program is our first virtual career panel. I'm Jay Dill, and joining me to co-host this event is Dr. Tim Su, professor in the Music, Arts, and Technology Department at IUPUI. Thanks, Jay. This panel will feature five local Indiana professionals to tell us about their careers in the audio field, how they got started, how their plans may have changed, what they're doing now, and perhaps offer some advice to students making decisions or about uh, how to get a job or how to begin a job search. Our panelists <clears throat> represent five different specialty areas in the broad field of audio. Those career areas selected for this program are acoustics, live sound and musical theater, the brave world of RF and wireless microphones and ear monitoring, TV sound, and audio system designs. We will introduce all of our panelists first, then each of them will have several minutes to tell us more about their current work and careers. Following that, we will have a question and answer period. Questions may be submitted at any time. Use the chat window. So before we introduce our guests, Tim would like to recognize the students in our audience, please. So on behalf of the IPOI Department of Music and Arts Technology and the Purdue School of Engineering Technology here in Indianapolis, I want to welcome all the students to this amazing career panel event. I want to send a special welcome to the three AES student sections in the student chapter of the Acoustical Society of America from here in Indiana, but also all the other AES student chapters who are attending the, from the Midwest region and from around the world. Please let us know in the chat box where you are watching from. For those high school students attending, feel free to reach out to us, IPY and AES, for more questions or inquiries about future academic paths. I just want to remind everybody watching tonight to participate via the chat and post your questions there. Uh, and also, be sure to like and subscribe to Central Indiana AES and Music Technology at IPY. And we will have a short survey at the very end of this program for you to fill out. So please take a couple moments to fill that out when we get done. Uh, Jay, why don't you start us, start us off tonight by introduce, introducing our first panelist. Yeah, well, let's meet all the panelists. After the introductions, each of them will tell you a little bit more about their specific lines of work. Representing the area of live sound and musical theater is Alan Alford. Alan has been a stage technician, audio systems tech, and audio mixing engineer for the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra since 2005. He's been in the field of live sound for 32 years. He's also worked for several sound companies in the, in the Indianapolis area, as well as a few across the nation, on assignments including corporate type one-offs, touring, and installation work. Alan earned his associate degree from Indiana University's School of Music and a bachelor's degree in general studies. He enjoys time with his family whenever he's not working at the ISO. Uh, that is prior to a current furlough. He also enjoys golf and listening to music from many genres. And something not commonly known about Alan, he does claim to be a distant relative of John Dillinger. <laughs> Next on the list is uh, uh, Elizabeth uh, Alford, known to me as Liz, specializing in the world of wireless. As a teenager, she had a knack for math and science that did not sing or play an instrument, even though surrounded by music. She knew she wanted to be involved in the industry and audio engineer sounded like a great idea. Liz received an associate degree from, I, from Indiana University and was hired on at Mid-America Sound. Two, two years later, she was finally on a tour bus and was one of very few female audio engineers at that time. She's been a mixing engineer, system technician, RF technician, and a stage technician. Liz took a long sabbatical to raise her children, and in the mid-2000s, she returned to the industry and is specializing in RF applications that would be wireless microphones and ear monitoring. And then uh, the third panelist representing the area of system design is Luke Malloy. In high school, he participated in various bands and orchestras where he played trombone, violin, drums, bass, while also being on golf and track teams. He studied acoustical engineering at Purdue University, minored in theater design and production, 
and continued playing trombone with seven music ensembles. He was a Purdue band's technology team leader, responsible for recording concerts, producing promotional videos, running live sound at events, and creating the All-American Marching Band Light Shows. After graduation, Luke began working at Diversified in Indianapolis as a drafting and design engineer. He assists in the design process of conference rooms, classrooms, and auditorium AV systems. And he also wanted you to know that uh, his pupils are two different sizes. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, representing the area of TV sound and freelance work is Clem Tiggs. Clem started his career at the local Fox TV station, operating camera, teleprompter, and audio on the nightly newscast. Soon he was working for NBC Sports as a production assistant, utility, and runner. During his time, he worked at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. He's been on PGA golf tournaments, the NBA All-Star Saturdays. Clem then switched to freelance status, working in various capacities for the Indiana Pacers, ESPN Sports, Canadian Basketball Association, and WWF Productions. In the early 2000s, when another person was sick, Clem knew the job, was able to fill in, and he's been an A2 ever since. And representing the field of acoustics is Gavin Haverstick. He's the owner, operator of a full-service acoustical consul consulting firm specializing in, in acoustical modeling, testing, and design. He earned a mechanical engineering degree with a focus in robotics from Colorado State University. Gavin has been involved in the acoustical design and analysis of over 5,000 challenging spaces, including recording studios, houses of worship, home theaters, gymnasiums, restaurants, conference rooms, edit suites, museums, and industrial facilities. An accomplished musician, Gavin has always had a passion for great music and quality sound. He enjoys collecting vinyl records, going to concerts, traveling, playing basketball, tennis, uh, and golf in time with his, with his family. But he also wanted you to know that he led the state in three-point percentage in, in his sophomore year in high school. So uh, that may be one of the most exciting facts we know about him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's awesome. So now it's time for our audio pros to tell us more about their careers and specifically what their work entails. We'll start with Alan, who is representing live sound and musical theater. So a question for Alan. Tell us about being in the audio driver's seat for the broad applications that you run into with the ISO. Uh, great lead in. Thank you, Jay. Um, so as a member of a four man crew with the Napa Symphony Orchestra, there's four of us stagehands by title. That's what I am. Stage technician number two, to be exact. And so I do everything from helping to set up the chair, music stands, the chairs, risers, taking risers out, putting them back in. And then any audio needs there might be anything from helping our contract recording engineer to uh, deploy several microphones overhead and ground support um, for classical applications and then which may not have any sound reinforcement at all to when we do have our pops concerts and the like I might have one microphone for our conductor or I could have for our we do a Yuletide holiday celebration every year and I have over a hundred uh, source inputs um, and then um, that's for the indoor season, Hillwork Circle Theater, and then there also is their Symphony on the Prairie. So, and then I have to advance productions a lot of times with, if we have Broadway singers that come in, um, or there's a small band or large band that's playing in front of the orchestra. So there's a bit of a production manager role in regards to audio that I have to fulfill, and if we have to augment microphones, um, and that happens a lot out at Symphony on the Prairie. Um, so. Uh, the variety is great, um, but I do miss it because we have been furloughed for, uh, I think it's been five months now, um, as many have in this industry. Uh, show business has been shut down, um, so it's been a very interesting time, to say the least. Good. Thank you, Alan. You're welcome. Uh, next is Liz Alford with details about the specialty area that many overlook, the brave and mysterious world of wireless microphones and in-air monitoring. Liz, could you share with us what a backline rental company is and how your job role with RF microphones and ears is such an interesting challenge? Sure, Jay. Sure, Jay, thanks for having me. Um, what I first want to say is, so Jonas Productions, who I worked for, is a uh, backline company. And what that means is many of the bands these days don't carry their own band gear with them. So guitar, uh, 
um, guitar amps, bass amps, keyboards in particular, drums. And uh, so we rent that stuff to them. Um, we, they, Jonas does stuff as big as, you know, Jazz Fest in New Orleans, um, Essence Fest. Uh, they were doing tons of cruises before the cruises stopped. Uh, semis full of gear, so large scale things. But they also have their common um, uh, uh, return band. So Temptations, Four Tops, which is really what started Jonas Productions, uh, Backline Rental. And uh, since then, you know, 30 years ago, that's when that started to take off. And then they were really initially an audio company uh, doing the tours. So you had your, you know, Mid-America Sound would do regional stuff, fairs and festivals type things. And then Jonas was your touring company, which is why I wanted to get on there so badly. And once I did, um, so he has one main client now that he still provides audio for, but with reference to the wireless systems, those along with the backline get rented out quite frequently, um, small packages, large packages up to like for Alan, for example, for Yuletide, we'll rent him 40 wireless microphones. Um, and so with that, uh, you have to have a frequency coordination these days. You have to sit down, you have to do the math, you have to figure out where you're not going to get interfered with. And some of the biggest problems we have are the FCC and limiting our bandwidth. So um, that has been a real challenge in the most recent years. Um, I, I really loved working at Jonas. I, I hope to get back there soon. For now, I've taken a, an office job to get by. Um, but uh, once I had my sabbatical and had been gone for about 10 years, by the time I came back, everything was digital. And so I was, you know, lost in a world of data. <clears throat> and so that's what I would say to people who are looking to get into this industry is that you need to focus on IT and networking because everything is on a network now. It's all data. There's no more signal. There's no more sound in that board. And when <clears throat> my coworker tried to tell me that there's no sound in that eight foot board, I'm like, wait, what do you mean? My mind was blown. I'm like, how can there not be sound in there? It's huge. It's all a computer. So learn your networking, learn, learn your IT. Um, when we were out uh, the last couple of years on a very big show, <clears throat> um, we could have used an IT person just on their own. So we had a, we had a frequency coordinator. We had a systems tech. We had a monitor tech. We had a stage tech, backline guys. But what we really needed was an IT guy to help us work our networks. Um, so that's a that's a key these days. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so Luke is our next Luke Malloy is the next panelist. Uh, he represents a major commercial area audio system design, and these system designs are everywhere: uh, restaurants, bars, schools, boardrooms, conference centers, houses of worship, malls, sports arenas, you name it. And these system designers work with acquisitions like Gavin for the integration of the system and the acoustics of these facilities. So a lot of students often overlook this and don't consider this an area of, uh, of, of importance of, of career choice. So Luke, can you tell us a little bit more about your path to becoming a system designer, and what, what your firm does, and what kind of skills are necessary for someone to work in your field? Sure. Um, yeah, so you pretty much covered it, the general gist of it pretty well. Um, we go into different venues, um, anywhere from, you know, a small huddle room with a, a couple people sitting at a table, all the way to a couple hundred uh, seat auditorium. Um, and and what we do is we work with the clients and we we figure out what their problem is, what they need um, their solution to be, and then we design a system around that with audio and video and control. Um, so what I do personally is I do, um, the, uh, system diagrams and all the drawings for those systems. So, um, I'm given a list of all the equipment that we sold the, the client and I have to figure out how it all fits together and, and how it's going to be installed and where. Um, so it's kind of really fun for me because it's a nice big puzzle that I get to solve and, um, yeah. That it's really fun. Um, I originally got into it. I was I was wanting to do um, sound design for movies, 
And my, uh, my sound advisor told me, you're not going to do that. <laughs> you, you went to Purdue and you're going to do uh, sound design or sound system design. And I was like, okay, that, <laughs> that works for me. And uh, I ended up taking an internship after that, that summer, and I really enjoyed it. And so that, that's kind of where it led me to. Um, as for skills, um, it, what you really have to be good at is, is being able to assess what the client needs and put aside any perfectionist um, desires to over-design a system and, you know, just get, get them what they need, whether it's uh, just a display and an input or, you know, a big line array system. Um, and that's, that's kind of the biggest skill that I've learned. I, I tend to be a little bit perfectionist, so I take a little bit longer on some things, but um, that's something I'm working on. But another thing is um, you, you kind of got to be well-rounded because we do um, we deal with control and audio and video. So um, having a good background of all of those things helps a lot. I've uh, filmed videos with friends kind of my whole life, so I have a, a good background of video, but I also played in bands, as you heard in my um, bio. So it's 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 really helpful for me to have have that background and uh, good ear for for what what audio systems sound good. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I I really in like I really like it because I also like buying gear, and uh, you pretty much get to buy gear every day and and try it out and not spend any of your own money. So that's kind of like the biggest biggest thing I look forward to is being able to do that. That's great. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Luke. Uh, many students start in the studio environment, but there's another world that's a specialty unto its own. Clem Tiggs is here to talk about work in TV sound as well as freelance work. So Clem, why did you decide to break into freelance work? And what are some of the differences that people thinking about this option should be aware of? Well, the world of freelance is something. You got to be your own. You're basically your own boss. That's what it's all about. Being being your own boss in freelance. Uh, as a A two, which a lot of you guys may not know anything about, I am an assistant to the mixer. That is the A one. So most in your world of audio, most people know the A one. He's a mixer. A two is the person who actually goes out and does all the work. I go out and I hook all the mics up. I make all the sound. So the mixer is able to actually give you back that sound itself. Uh, I've been uh, doing A2 work for now almost 20 years. And as far as it being a freelance type of thing, it's, again, you're, it, you have to be a person who could do work on your own. It's a job that requires someone gives you, okay, Here's a list of things. I need you to go plug these mics in and put them where I can hear what I want to hear. Now, that sounds a little crazy, but that's pretty much how a, a two works in the freelance world. But something that's really great about being freelance is I determine where I want to work. I determine what companies or what sporting or what movies I want to work on. By being a freelancer, I'm able to do any of those things. It's, it's really great. I've done Super Bowls. I've done uh, All-Stars, basketball All-Stars. I've done uh, baseball, long home runs and all those things. And I've actually got to put the mic somewhere so you can hear the back cracks. And that's something that's really nice. Um, the job itself, it's... It's a, it's a headache. It's a headache because you really have to pay attention because if something breaks, you have to fix it. You have to know how to fix it. You, they don't, it's not no handbook on how to fix whatever it is. You need to know these things in advance. So if you're going to try to be an A2 and a freelancer, one thing most important is you determine how much work you're going to do. You determine how much income you're going to make by how much work you're going to do. The most important is you're dealing with talent, so you have to check your attitude. You're dealing with people that are just sometimes obnoxious, but you have to always be very nice, kind, and trustworthy towards them and working with the microphones and 
that's pretty much uh, it. Is, it is in a whole, in a nutshell, right there. Thanks, Clem. That's that's great. Um, so our last uh, panelist is uh, Gavin Haverstick. Uh, he's going to talk to you about acoustics. Uh, let's see, G Gavin. Uh, oh, I lost my question. Uh, uh, he's going to talk, talk to us about acoustics. Can you tell us generally what an acoustical consultant does, what your path was to become an acoustician, and how one can get started in this career as an ac acoustician? Sure. Yeah, um, I'm an acoustical consultant, and, and what that is is pretty much uh, all things to do with interior room acoustics or sound transmission. We get involved with uh, how a room is constructed, how it's uh, designed as far as its wall angles and, and uh, um, how it's physically constructed to keep sound within the room. But then at the end of the day, uh, making sure that the uh, sound quality is as high uh, quality as possible. Um, the way I got into it, my, my degree is actually mechanical engineering with a robotics focus, but I've been a musician my whole life, and so I parlayed that into a, a, a career in acoustics. Um, there are certainly schools, great schools out there that have an acoustical engineering program, and uh, had I to do it over again, I probably would have gone that route. But after you go through three and a half years of mechanical engineering school, you want to finish it. Uh, and so luckily, after school, uh, I was head of engineering at a company called Orlex Acoustics, which is a manufacturer of acoustical materials. And then in 2009, I started Haverstick Designs, which is uh, our consulting firm. And we focus in uh, a lot of different fields, but probably where we made our reputation was designing recording studios for musicians. And so we've done, you know, work for you know Ringo Starr, Coldplay, Twenty One Pilots, a bunch of different bands out there. Um, and we design studios from the ground up, or we renovate ones that are existing that maybe aren't performing as as well as possible. Uh, we also do a lot of performance halls, churches, auditoriums, uh, conference rooms, pretty much anything where sound is produced. Uh, we can get involved with that and. Um, it's kind of a two-step process, isolating the sound, making sure the, the good sounds stay in and the bad sounds stay out, uh, and then also uh, making the room sound good after the fact, so high accuracy for recording studios, good speech intelligibility and musical clarity for performance spaces. And uh, yeah, we work all over the world. Uh, it's a really fun job because uh, as an engineer, I always call engineering degrees problem solving degrees really. And, and really uh, um, that's the fun part about acoustics is you're really solving people's problems, making things better for them. Um, and it's fun because no two rooms are alike. You know, every room has its own challenges and, and uh, it, it's fun to tackle that. Um, and I would say that my advice for any students out there um, is that just follow whatever you're passionate about. Um, you know, it, it's it's tough. I mean, coming out of school uh, with an engineering degree, I had uh, two main job offers I was looking at. It was uh, head of engineering at Orlex or uh, optimize the bottling process for Pepsi. And um, I, uh, one, like Coke better, so it's conflict of interest. And then two, uh, I just love music. You know, I, I want to be around that. Uh, and and uh, so I took the less uh, paying job, um, and, and it wasn't in Colorado, it was in Indiana, um, but I'm so much happier being around uh, what I'm passionate about. That's awesome. So, uh, thanks. thank you so thank much. You. Uh, I'll go. Uh, so it's time to take uh, questions from our viewers. Uh, Tim and I will relate these questions uh, from the chat room to our panelists. Uh, we do have a couple that came in already. Uh, Tim, do you want to take the first one for Luke? Sure. No, no problem. So Luke, uh, so the question is, what type of software do you use? Uh, and maybe you can expound upon that to talk about like what type of computer skills or programming skills that you, you might need for someone like you? Yeah, so... Um the one that we use a lot is AutoCAD. Um, pretty much all of our drawings are done in AutoCAD. We use some other ones like uh, SketchUp or um, you know Revit, but that that's more with uh, 3D modeling when we get into that stuff. Um, when we get into speaker designing stuff, um, you know, figuring out what speakers work best in a in a room, we'll use Ease, um, sometimes Excel. So um, Basically, if you, if you can get a chance to take any class on any sort of computer-aided design software, it translates pretty, pretty easily across um, just getting to know what, you know what type of tools in the software do what you know, for drawing lines or rectangles and all that stuff. They're pretty similar. Uh, that's great. Thanks. Um I have a question for Clem. 
Uh, how did you get on the path to becoming a freelancer? Uh, assuming that you worked full time on a basic broadcast gig, picked up some other work, and then how'd you build your network in order to be able to get jobs and build the kind of trust that you have with uh, you know, the people that hire you? Honestly, I uh, started as a runner for NBC Sports. By being a runner, I was able to meet all of the different people and camera people, producers, directors, and I was at uh, next to them and got to learn how to do different works, <laughs> I mean, different jobs, how to actually do that. Uh, my network really, I would say, I built it up when I was um, by doing the different jobs, all actuality, because I was uh, working at Fox 59 and uh, here in Indianapolis, and I was in production, and I got to meet a lot of people, and from that, I got a couple of jobs, and again, they were all as production assistants, and from that, you just watch what's going on around you, and that's how I got more into being an A2, and from that, each job, I do my best, meet more people, do more work, and it, I kept building it up from there, and uh, I talk a lot, so. That's another thing. I'm a personable person. <laughs> you, that's you. Yeah, that that you are. Um, <laughs> your so your your networking was really built grassroots, basically. Uh, yes. Just yes, just was doing the work and and working with people and getting to know them and learning the skills. Yeah. And the more you yes. did that, the more you proved yourself. The better your network got, the higher the pay yes. gigs you get. The higher the pay and got asked to do more and more. And then people start getting sick. So they say, hey, throw you in there and see how you work out. Yeah. Oh, you worked out. Yeah. Let's move you on Man. to another gig. And that's pretty much how I worked out. So, so got so, so phone in the skillet and I was ready. <laughs> that's how yeah. it works out. Like that backup so quarterback, you, you keep practicing. <laughs> right. Go ahead. Right. Wait for your day. Yeah, right. Wait for your day. Uh, someone uh, asked a question. What What is a runner? What is a runner? Gopher. Yeah. A runner is a gopher. Yep. You do what? You go help out the camera people. You help out uh, uh, producers. He go get them zero copies. You go and get coffee. You go pick up the talent. You go pick up uh, some of the camera people from the airport. You pick people up and you send them on their way. But that's what you are. That's why it's called a runner. You're running. You're constantly going to do stuff. And that's what a runner is. Very good. Very good. So did you create an LLC for yourself, uh, establish yourself yes. basically as, as a uh, small business? Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, Tiggs LLC, uh, along with audio, I bid for uh, different contracts through the military. So that's a constant yeah. thing that I do all around in all the military and all different things around the world. So I'm able to bid under Tiggs LLC. I'm actually, you actually can uh, Google it, look it up, and it'll tell you a little bit about exactly what I do with Tiggs LLC. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, Tim, you want to take the next question for Gav? Sure. So the next question is for Gavin. Uh, and they want, to, they, they want to ask you, how often do you travel to build studios? Uh, do you travel often to build the different studios? Like, and, and other things yeah. you do. Yeah, you know, I live here in Indiana. Everyone uh, wonders, you know, you're a studio designer. Why are you in Carmel, Indiana, instead of Nashville or L.A. or somewhere else? But uh, this is where family is, and uh, so I, and I grew up in Indiana. And uh, luckily, if I'm close to an airport in normal times, I can just jump on a plane and get somewhere. But yeah, we've we've done studios all over the world. Um, you know, Australia, Europe, uh, South Africa. Mexico City, you know, uh, and then all over the U.S., um, ninety percent of our works out of state or overseas. So, um, in uh, normal times, I was traveling, you know, typically two or three times a month at least. Uh, sometimes more than that, because uh, the engineer in me always wants to define the problem before I try to solve it. So, I usually like to go in and do acoustical testing of, of existing spaces, or um, you know, uh, try try to put some data to that. And um, uh, in this. Uh, kind of coronavirus world that we're living in right now. I, I've only traveled three times um, and each one, it's it's so funny, it's something that, that you just take for granted. Traveling was second nature to me and now you're second guessing everything you touch. It's uh, it's absolutely bizarre. Um, but um, 
yeah, I, I, I expect that the traveling will continue, but um, I am doing a lot more things remotely. Like I developed a remote testing procedure that I can uh, get data uh, just by having the client help me out with that. But yeah, so pretty much we, we do work all over the world to answer the question. What's the biggest challenge you have with communicating with, uh, with your clients that aren't local? Um, you know, as far as that, I mean, there's so many ways that we can have, you know, virtual meetings you know, similar to what we're doing right now. Um, you know, but there's, it's hard to replace, you know, being there on site, uh, being in the room with them, talking to them in real time, but more than anything, just, you know, going out to dinner with them or going to lunch and learning more about their family and things like that. Cause uh, you know, everything that we do is, is highly personable. You, you know, it's, uh, if you go to Haversick Designs website, you can see every single room we do looks different because it's a reflection of that individual person. And I need to know more about them in order to do my job effectively. And so that's been the biggest challenge, I think, is just not having as much interaction in person with people. Thank you. Jay, do you want to take the next very one? Good. Yeah, very good. Um, this one is for Alan. Uh, for a long time, the ISO uh, had for their front of house desk, a uh, big analog Soundcraft Series 5. You recently changed over to the digital world. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that transfer took place and what it's meant to you in your daily workflow? Yeah, like you say, Jay, we initially, when I inherited the job 15 years ago, the ISO owned a large mainframe and fully analog Series 5 audio desk. Um, found out early on, primarily that would only get used out at Symphony on the Prairie. We would put it on a, a wagon with robust air wheels, and we would use a gator and roll it out for the Symphony on the Prairie events each weekend. Um, we found, due to the makeup, the architecture of the theater, it was just too big and too heavy to bring that big desk out and, and pretty much only use it for special events. We would use it for Yuletide for all the orchestra inputs at the time. Um, but by and large, I had a smaller frame desk. It was a 32 input channel desk that I would use for pops. And then even, I would even go smaller than that to keep my footprint small for classical. I'd put a little Mackie mixer. So as time went by and we were looking into what we would need that would work for Yuletide, because I got to the point where I was making the transition from the series five. And at the time I was using, um, an Avid profile digital desk that we would rent for the month. Um, but I knew that that technology was getting older and probably wouldn't be something ideal for the orchestra to spend money in. Um, so it worked out pretty nicely when a local vendor, uh, Force Technologies, was coming in to put in a, a high-definition um, audio and video, well, more of a video system. Um, A.J. Fager, the proprietor, thought it would be a good idea not only to incorporate the needs of streaming the classical events and having a digital desk in the record booth to then communicate with our video suite. But with all the networking in the theater, why not incorporate the sound reinforcement console as well? So um, he proposed this, a Yamaha CL5, and um, that's worked out really well. I use that for everything we do in the theater except for Yuletide due to the limitations of the inputs. Um, um, and in fact, the last Yule Tide in 2019, I used uh, a Yamaha Revage, which is, it takes a lot of the operating system of the CL5, but then on steroids. Um, and it was great. I mean, again, yeah, we've all had to, between wireless workbench, uh, the digital audio desks, um, it's all about networking. Turning the sound system on. Mid America Sound provided our sound system at Symphony on the Prairie last couple summers, and it requires a laptop to turn it on. So, uh, having IT as a foundation can't be stressed enough. And if schools aren't pushing that now, even in the audio industry, then they're leaving students a little short in that. And it makes it so much nicer just to throw a plug in. in. You push a button, you got a plug in, whether it's a compressor or a multi effects or a Dugan auto mixer. You don't have to get behind a rack with wires and I mean, you can do it like on the fly immediately. You can put a plug in, sneak it in because you feel like you need a DS or something. So that transition, although I went in kicking and screaming into digital world has been wonderful. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks for that. And I do remember some of the screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, how do I make this work? <laughs> uh, uh, uh. So Liz, I got a couple of questions for you. 
Um, so some folks uh, uh, are chiming in about the software that you use for RF coordination. And then also about the wireless tech or the IT part. And what do you use for connecting the backline digitally? I think part of that is how you do your RF coordination, the software you use for that, uh, on-site monitoring of what's going on RF-wise, and any of that as it pertains to the overall network of what's going on in the stage. Can you address any of that? Sure. All of it? So, <laughs> absolutely. Um, it was several years ago that, that I went back to work at Jones Productions, and w in that time period, everything went digital. Um, and so what I was more easily, which was more easy for me to wrap my head around was the wireless microphones, because still there are waves in the air. It's still an analog transmission, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, uh, I had to ramp up really fast. And so I, I was using, I used wireless workbench for our Shure microphones. I used, uh, I used the Sennheiser app or program for my Sennheiser microphones. But what I would do is when I would get on the bus, I would uh, put it all into IMD software, which is kind of outdated now. So with this huge FCC band transmission squish, um, wireless workbench has done a really nice job keeping up with it. Um, Sennheiser, not so much and IMD, not so much, but IMD was a, was a software that I could take both of them, name them in the frequency coordination. I could uh, program for the next day using my zip code. Um, I could zoom in. I could look at the TV channels. I could see how far apart my microphones were going to be. Um, and of course we had uh, in-ear monitors too. So, and they're wider than regular microphones. And then, then you have digital microphones or, you know, transmitters now, which take up way less space. So you can really cram them in there. Um, and then I would try plugging them back into, then I would put them all back into either wireless workbench or the uh, Sennheiser software or the, uh, yeah, Sennheiser software. So that when I walked in the next day, I open up my laptop, I plug in my cable, and it talks to everybody and programs them instantly. Um, so it took about an hour's worth of work the day before. Um, and then, of course, you have to turn them all on and make sure that there's nothing else that's popped up since last night or since, you know, you got there, because who knows? And with the uh, saturation of waves these days used by cell phones and towers and, and everybody wants their piece of the... RF spectrum, uh, oftentimes you'll have to just turn your microphones on and let them sit all day um, to make sure that nothing's going to hit them. So it's it's tough, but that's what that's why we do live audio. You know, it makes it interesting. So you basically, once you've done your coordination, you get to the site, you fire up your uh, devices, and essentially claim your space in the air, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. You squat on those frequencies. That's what that's called. Yeah. Spoken like a true RF warrior. <laughs> <laughs> well, man. Uh, Tim, you want to take the next uh, next question? A lot of software questions, it seems like. Uh, the, the question is, what type of software do you, do you use in your designs? Uh, is, is SketchUp one of them? Is that a, 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 uh, what other type of CAD software much, much you use? Oh, sorry. Uh, we have another question. So, sorry about that, Gavin. Um, since you've been to so many places around the world, do you? What do you think about the architecture around the world and how that the difference in the architecture from like here versus uh, in Asia or in Europe? How how does that affect your designs and how you uh, how you proceed with your acoustical parameters? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, definitely architecture. Uh, it, it plays a part as far as how the room is shaped and what materials are being used. You know, uh, right, right now we're designing a studio in uh, Perth, Australia. And it's just interesting finding uh, the, the common building materials that they use and, and what has been tested acoustically and what hasn't. Um, you know, so we're, we're always looking at, at different things um, and, and how that's going to impact things. As far as architecture, just the, the shape of the room, you know, in Europe, you see so many more, uh, you know, 
kind of dome shaped rooms and, and, uh, you know, concave surfaces, which play havoc with acoustics because it focuses all the energy to the, to the center of the radius of curvature and all of that. But, um, but even just in areas where they use plaster more than drywall, uh, drywall absorbs low frequency sounds fairly well. Uh, whereas plaster doesn't budge as much and doesn't, doesn't give us as much absorption in that range. So, uh, we certainly see, um, you know, uh, and, and here in, here in the U.S., you know, sometimes, uh, especially in, in strip malls and things like that, where they're just trying to build things as economically as possible, usually sound isolation is worse uh, just because they're using lighter weight materials or they don't take the walls all the way up to the deck. They just stop it directly above the drop tile. So there's a little bit of, of differences depending on where in the world we're working. Cool. Thank you. Um, Jay, do you want to take the next one? Luke, I think this one's probably in uh, your wheelhouse here. Uh, this this person asks, they're currently majoring in audio engineering technology at Purdue University. <laughs> what field will they end up in? The classes they're, they're taking are related to electronics and digital systems. Based on that and based on your experience, you kind of see maybe where that pathway might be headed for them? Yeah, I, I would say that there are, are still a, a few different avenues you could take. Um, but given that um, plan of study, the the most common one is to, to do some sort of um, hands-on work with the equipment itself um, because most of your classes are, you know, hands-on with the technology. Um, so I would say, you know, anything from installing the systems we design to any any of the the jobs that um, some of the other people on here do um, with your background, I'm I'm assuming you're probably in theater design and production as well. So you have some of that live live experience and and sound design as well. So um, it the key is to just keep um, keep your options open and and don't necessarily pick one until you've tried a couple. If you have the opportunity. Um, if you have a couple summers, try interning in the different fields and see which one you like the best. And then, you know, once you graduate, try and narrow it down, narrow it down to one that you want to really attack. That's what I would say. So, uh, speaking of internship, uh, did you do your internship at Sensory Technologies? Yes, I did. I also had one before at Cole Digital, which is a uh, home integration system so similar stuff but just uh home stuff rather than corporate um but i didn't do what i said to do because i got a late start and and was sort of uh behind with that but um yeah i i, inter I interned with sensory technologies which is now diversified so it was it was a nice transition to be able to work with them as as a student and then graduate and and work with them full-time what kind of work were you tasked to do so at first i pretty much would would get drawings that were marked up from the field after they were installed and i would have to go back into the old files and and update them to make sure that the drawings reflect what was actually installed and then towards as the built. end i started getting yeah as built yeah mm -hmm. um and towards Towards the end of the summer, once I got a little bit more comfortable with that and, and caught up on the giant pile of as builts that were stacking up, I started doing um, new drawings. So, kind of more what I'm doing now. Um, so, it, there's there's multiple different avenues you can take there as well. There's there's been a couple other interns we've had that worked more with the field, um, doing installations, or um, some other people do are customer service route, which is similar to field work, but it's uh, more like fixing things that are not currently working. So um, yeah, you just got to kind of try your options and see what you like. Awesome. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question that is kind of to everybody. I know many of my students often ask, what's the best way to get an internship or uh, or like an apprenticeship or something like that? Do you have, does, does anybody have any advice to how you, you can secure an internship or how to apply for one? I think Alan. Go, uh, go Alan. Ahead. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, if you're uh, interested in the live sound industry, uh, there are several vendors in the in the Indianapolis area: Mid America Sound, Jonas Productions, Dodd Technologies. Um, and oftentimes, the summer is the busiest time. So as school starts to release, I would start pounding the pavement and knocking on doors and calling people in the spring and follow up weekly, if not monthly, so that come summertime, when it's busy, uh, they need people to load trucks and stuff like that. And in the live sound industry, that's where a lot of us started, loading the trucks, unloading the trucks, setting up shows. So as far as the live sound industry, that's a good place to start with those vendors. Um, yeah, similar to that, I, I actually got my first internship through a friend of a friend. Um, so kind of, kind of going along that line of networking is really key, especially when people want experienced workers, but you don't have experience, you have to figure out a way to kind of finesse your way to get some experience. And sometimes that means working for free, like my first internship was. <laughs> Yeah, I have uh, something to add to that, too. Uh, when I had my internship out of college at Oralex Acoustics, um, I actually contacted them with, uh, without knowing them. I just kind of cold, cold called them, and uh, I was looking for an internship for that summer. And uh, they told me they didn't have an internship program. And, but they said they remember from the, the lunch that they had with me, the first thing I said when I sat down was, I'll do anything. Like, I, I, I don't care about the warehouse. I don't care you know, what I do. And, and most of that summer, as an, you know, a, a student in engineering uh, program, I just packed boxes of, of product and shipped it out. And I loved it. I loved every second of it. Um, and one thing that, that uh, I think by doing anything, when you go into an internship, uh, it helps you for your career long term, because later on, when I was head of engineering or Midwest regional manager there, um, I knew what not to do to the warehouse. Don't call them at four o'clock and say this needs to be shipped out the door today. You know, it's just not going to happen. And so it's good to, to get your hands dirty in, in all aspects of a business. And so I wouldn't, um, you know, turn your nose up at any opportunities if it's in the field of what you want to do. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Clem, I got, uh, Clem, I got a question here for you. And that is, uh, in your functions as a, uh, as an A2, in particularly in yes. doing the world of sports, uh, you you have participated in NBA, MLB, professional PGA. You probably did bowling at some time in your life. I did. <laughs> I did bowling. I really did. Out of Woodland Bowl, Woodland Bowl, we did I'm, professional bowling, PBA out there. Yes, I, I believe you. I believe you. Uh, <laughs> It seems there are a lot. There are a lot of applications that take place in each one of those sports that are very unique. You, you see a lot of parabs yeah. on football yeah. on, on football stadiums. You have miked rims for basketball. You have all sorts in the Gymna field of golf. Yeah, gymnastics. Yeah, yeah. in the field of golf, uh, you often see. Uh, shotgun microphones near the tee box to catch the yes. uh, impact of the ball. Can you share any of your like enlightened experiences for any of those particular sports that you know uh, people might find interesting, amusing? Kind of like the things you don't know about that take place that you hear, but you don't know how you hear. It. You and you, you all have you only okay. have like about three minutes to do it. You know? <laughs> okay, I gotta do it quick then. Okay, all right. <laughs> this could then, as long you long were long saying. Long. As you okay, as you were saying, you uh, had the one mic that you got to see near the that you could hear the uh, ball when it goes into the hole in golfing, and in some cases they might put a lob mic down the side of it. They would bury it in there, and that's when you hear it go all the way in the thump thump. Uh, one of the other interesting things is when we do swimming and diving, we take uh, shotgun mics and we put condoms on them and we drop them to the bottom of the pool. And that's how you're able to hear when the people hit the water and the splash sounds because there's actually microphones. And, of course, you have to keep them dry. And that's why it's best to use the non-lubricated comes in, wrap them up. That's one of the, one of the craziest mm -hmm. things right there. Mm -hmm. uh, gymnastics. Uh, when they're on the uh, 
uneven, uneven bars or whatever you want to call it. Thing. <laughs> we put lobs in the inside, inside the loops, and that way you're able to hear that. Uh, uh, wrestling, we put mics up under the mat, and then one right pointed directly into the area, and that's when you hear the grunting and the smacking and all that other stuff. That you really don't care about, but that's when you hear that. Uh, in, in, in the NBA, in the NBA, we actually put microphones by the coaches, as in they are sitting up, uh, low lob mics are pointed directly in, at the coaches. And I'm probably get in trouble for this, but, uh, they don't know that they're there. And most of the time they get in trouble for cussing and all that because we can hear them. And then the ref ends up hearing them. Uh, we had that happen at University of Illinois when they played North Carolina, and uh, the coach got attacked because of that. <laughs> and then he was not happy with me after the game. <laughs> so that's just that's just a few. That's just for our, some of the mics. Thanks, thanks, thanks for that, okay. uh, uh -huh. Liz. Kind of a similar sort of thing. Uh, would you assembled a lot of wireless microphone and inner monitor systems? that have gone out on tour. Sometimes you go out on tour with them. Um, do you have uh, any interesting anecdotes of those experiences? Um, uh, good ones too, not the ones where the, the talent goes crazy <laughs> because they can't hear what they want to hear, but uh, it kind of uh, things that you could share with the, uh, the audience that you know might resonate for someone that's really interested in getting into RF. Well, as far as microphones go, uh, this most recent tour that I was out with um, had some really interesting wireless microphone placements because it was kind of a Broadway-esque show. It incorporated video and dialogue and the band and the talent. And um, so a lot of times... So, okay, so they're tap mics. You can use uh, microphones in your taps. So when you're tap dancing, you hear the tapping. I know Alan's used this before, and this was something that we used out on the road this past time. Um, we had wireless microphones hanging from the battens up above um, to get <laughs> to get some you know ambient sound for that. Uh, we've had them on the downstage edge of the stage uh, pointed up to get. Uh, all kinds of acoustic type stuff because a lot of this was um, acoustic in the environment, but needed to be reinforced because uh, it was a fairly, you know, it was a large playhouse or something like that. Um, the, uh, the tour that I was on, we had this gigantic piano. It was, um, so seven upright pianos long, right? And each section had its own uh, wireless bell pack. Uh, and so you'd have to, you know, turn them on, check them before the show, <clears throat> but then it would fly up and be out of the way. And so, uh, some interesting shenanigans with that going on. Um, oh my gosh. I just can't think of anything super funny off the top of my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. I, I think basically the kind of the idea is, the unexpected and the out of the box is kind of the norm, really. And, and that's what, what makes to, it fun. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes it fun. That's what makes it interesting because whether your wireless microphone is working or not, the show is going to keep going. So you got to yeah. fix it on the fly. You got to, you know, pay attention. There's so much more involved these days than when I first started um, wireless microphones. So there are like 80 on that one show. Uh, and so, you know, wireless frequency coordinator is a job now. It didn't used to be, it was just kind of superfluous to the stage antics, but yeah, I mean, and some of the most interesting, fascinating things have developed over time with these new, um, digital microphones and synchronization and, and like, just fascinating. It's fascinating. It's really interesting to me, and I really enjoy doing it. So, yeah, these are some, these are some great times we're living in. Uh, I think from the technology <laughs> stand, the technology standpoint of it, anyway. Yeah, yeah other than the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> uh, Tim, uh, there was a couple other questions that came up on the board. Do you want to address those? And then I think we're going to need to wrap it. We had like three or four, but maybe I will uh, pick one of these. Uh, someone mentioned uh, asking about Cedia uh, and, and people's involvement with it. Uh, maybe we'll just toss this to the whole panel. But may, I, I want to broaden that question and say and ask, what is the importance of professional organizations and attending conferences or trade shows and how that may help somebody uh, starting off their career or progressing their, their, um, their career? So thank you. Yeah, I am. Um Sure. Uh, at CEDIA, we're, we're a member of CEDIA here at Haversick Designs, and um, interestingly enough, they've, they've asked us the last two years to uh, actually uh, give a presentation on home studio recording and design, uh, which is not necessarily in their wheelhouse. Like uh, that, That's not what their AV integrators and, and uh, get asked to do a ton of, but it's happening more and more often, and so they have us give a, a course at their expo every year now uh, on that. But as far as professional organizations, like we're members of NCAC, which is the National Council of Acoustical Consultants, uh, AES, ASA, um, CEDIA, uh, and, and we also help sponsor the, the local AIA chapter for um, uh, architects. Um, and every one of those, you, you just you get more connections. You grow your, your network. Um, you're around like-minded people, which is just like uh, invigorating, you know, and, and uh, being able to, to have common things to talk about. Um, but uh, we've we found a lot of value in, in going to conferences, and uh, we don't go to as many as we'd like to because we're traveling so often just uh, on our own. Um, you know, another weekend out of the out of the um, the state is is not always in the cards. But um, we try to attend as many as we can, and, and uh, definitely are better for it. Thank you. Uh, do we have time for another one? Yeah. Sure, why not? Uh, uh, Clem, this one goes to you. Uh, I think people want some dirt on this question. What is it like to work with professional <laughs> musicians or athletes, or uh, do you do, do you deal directly with them or with their managers? No, I deal directly with everybody. Uh, really funny. I am on uh, the last dance. I believe that's what it was. Uh, number what is it? Uh, episode three with Michael Jordan. So I got to I've got to work with some people. Uh, I got to hang out with Bill Murray uh, in Chicago. I got to actually meet Tiger Woods uh, right after he won the Masters, his first Masters. So the people, uh, if you just talk to them like regular, it's fine. But if you come up to them like, oh, my favorite and all that, they're like, uh, get away from me. But as long as you treat them just like they're the everyday person, you don't have any problems with anybody. It's really cool. Cool. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim, do you have anything else? Uh, yeah. One last question for Gavin. Uh, any strange out of the box situations, acoustical design you've had to deal with recently? Hmm. Okay. So out of the box, I'm trying to think of, of uh, one that comes to mind. We, we certainly, you know, we get projects all the time uh, where, um, uh, you know, uh, the the normal project is there's there's so many different budget limitations that you have to work around and and that's uh, I actually enjoy that because um, you know that's real life you know not everybody has just a a blank checkbook but there are occasions where where that does happen where people say we want the best sounding mix room in L A and you need to make it happen and uh, um, you know there's one in particular for a client um, a private client there that uh, you know they asked me what ceiling height we wanted to work with and and uh i said well the taller the ceiling height the better it's going to be uh you know the bigger the volume of the room the better the low frequency production is going to be reproduction is going to be and uh, they said well we have this one building and we'll just rip out the second floor and we'll brace it for seismic code and you can have 20 feet to work with will that be okay and i said yes, of course and uh, i mean they probably spent three million on this one room uh just building this one room and uh uh, I mean, it's not really even a testament to what I can do. Uh, I mean, the, the frequency response was like plus or minus a dB and a half in the low end. And uh, I mean, it's something that anyone would kill for. Um, but that's what happens when you can do anything you want, you know, have a, a really large room. So um, so that was kind of fun. You know, that's kind of out of the ordinary. Normally there's budget restrictions, but sometimes you can play around a little bit more. 
Cool, Jay. Awesome. Do you have anything else? Good for you. No, I think it's time to wrap it up here, Tim. Uh, make sure to send a, a, a genuine heart. Well, uh, felt thank you to all of our panelists, Alan, Liz, Luke, Clem, Gavin, uh, and, and the people that worked on the backside of this, Barry, AJ. Uh, thank you, Tim. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, give us some feedback. i got to write read the script here. Give us some feedback. Hit the like button and fill out the survey you'll receive by email. Check our website, BBAES website. And join us for our next virtual AES section meeting. We want to acknowledge, again, Force Technology Solutions for originating this virtual event. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So, uh, you know, good night, everybody from Indianapolis. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you.